right, go here Jen. we are. Go Jen. <laughs> <laughs> you got to crack it open with some humor. Um, here we are again, uh, Jason and Grace and myself, Jennifer Holton, at the Grand Reunion following the Festival of the Year, which was Emergence Creative, down at the heart of the southwest of Western Australia, which is Margaret River. Huge shout out to Matt and Anita, who made all of that possible a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, due to popular demand at our session, which was called Can You Wing It? Apparently You Can, Global Perspectives from the Creative Industries, we have Grace Lamb and Jason Casabianco. Um, I didn't Kept pronounce it probably. <laughs> How many times you know, have I said that, Jason? Just introduce yourself. It was close. Just it was close you. enough. <laughs> you'll, know, you'll do a much better job with some Italian flair. It's Jason Capobianco. Capobianco. Why don't you have just a simple name, like surname, like L-A-M? Yeah. It's so much easier. So good. Make my life so much easier too, if it was. Yes. So people who don't know that we are married, and when we first got married, I'm like, oh, should I? People are like, are you going to take a surname? I'm like, hell no. Trying no to book why a, would you? Trying to book a, a, a restaurant in Hong Kong with Capo Bianco is like yeah. impossible. We share the same problem, Grace. My husband's last name is Dibdal, which is actually Danish, despite many people thinking okay. it's Indian. But um, yes, two things also, too, hard, too difficult to spell, but yep. um, I have to say, pro-feminist woman, gonna keep, I've, I've had my name for 37 years, I ain't gonna change it now, exactly. eh? Exactly. Here, here. Here, here. In Hong Kong, I became Mr. Lamb because it was just easier. <laughs> Brilliant, absolutely love it. The tables are turning. Yeah. So look, you guys, yes, are both the professional and romantic duo, and we're, I cannot wait to hear more about that in a minute. But um, for the benefit of anyone who wasn't at Emergence Creative and didn't see the amazing sessions that rolled out over a few days in Margaret River, I would love to do a kind of more formal introduction to um, both of you and your absolutely formidable career. So it's been a real pleasure to get to know you via Emergence Creative. I think we could probably say we're even friends now. Um, and... Uh, Basically, your bios are so um, detailed and, um, and so impressive, quite genuinely, that they deserve kind of due attention. So without further ado, we have here a Hong Kong native, but London raised, Grace Lam, who started her journey as an international student in London, where she trained at the world renowned Central St. Martins as a graphic designer. Her colourful and exhilarating career path, path brought her into a nexus of industry powerhouses, including Condé Nast, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Tatler, Dior, Burberry, net a and Ralph Lauren. Her personal Rolodex includes direct lines to fashion behemoths such as Edward Enonful OBE, the recent editor-in-chief of British Vogue, and Dame Anna Wintour, whose accolades need no further definition. She has collaborated with and styled more celebrities than my introduction has time to detail. Her personal interests span advocating for increased awareness around topics such as menopause, which I hope we talk more about today, Grace, and dedicating 24 weekends of the year to one of her greatest passions, Formula One, another topic Go we're going <laughs> to talk about today, which I can't wait to hear. So I'm thrilled that Australia has inherited the talents of this remarkable woman and beyond excited for the projects and collaborations you are going to yield in the coming year. So Grace, cannot wait to hear more. Uh, before we do hear from you, I'm going to intro Jason. So your partner in crime, um, a professionally and partner in life as well, the Australian born but internationally successful photographer, Jason Capobianco, <laughs> Perfect. is in the studio with us today. So Jason, you have built a remarkable portfolio of some of the most iconic and dynamic celebrity portraits, cover shoots and creative campaigns within the fashion and beauty industry. You have collaborated with brands such as Vogue, Harper's Bazaar and GQ and have amassed an extraordinary black book of platinum clients, including Dom Perignon, Mr. Porter, Sotheby's and Van Cleef and Arpels, who are coming to Perth, I believe. Yeah. Tell us more about that. How exciting. Um, your portraits, in my humble opinion, exude a serene aesthetic that encapsulates the enigmatic beauty and humanity of your subjects which has included global icons Kate Blanchett, Sophia Lauren, who, as I said before, I absolutely love, one of my greatest icons of all time, Justin Bieber, Gemma Chan and Chow Yun-Fat. Jason is a master of his art form and has carved out one of the most successful creative profiles in the Asia Pacific region. So you've located back to Perth um, since 2019 as a couple and as a family with your son. Um, and of course, Hong Kong's loss has been Australia's gain. So guys, hello, amazing hello. to have you both here. That and was a nice introduction, thank you. you before, are, before we go further, I brought something that, just to add to um, <laughs> spice it up. <laughs> this is Quite uh, literally. 
swear jar. Oh, hey, there we go. I love <laughs> so it. This is most, mostly for me. Have, but you, have you watched the um, New Girl? No. The, okay, five guys in the loft, and and uh, Schmidty has like a swear jar for saying the most ridiculous, like profane things. So <laughs> well, I love it. You're I like mean, Schmidt. Who's gonna Who's gonna bring cash or coins these days, right? So, so being Chinese, we're, we're all about food. So whoever swears, we're just gonna go. I okay. love it. Grace, let's not <laughs> kid ourselves. Food. You're this the only food. one putting food in the jar, right? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Keep it on that side. She'll be the busiest. But that's not the only thing I brought today. This is what I was, oh! I was thinking you were going to drag up. Okay, for the it's benefit not... of listeners who can't see this video, Grace has yes. brought out a very mystical-looking box. Yes. Which she is currently unzipping. It is. Drum roll. What is this? Hello, hello. It's my <laughs> own karaoke mic. <laughs> 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 okay, I love it. You did email Josh yesterday saying you were going to bring a mic yes. and swore you weren't lying. I definitely thought is. you were. Here it is. So I don't want to interrupt, you know. Yeah. The flow. The flow. Are or you, are you going recording. to round this chat off with a, a song? That'll sure, be a wrap up. Yeah. It'll be a Chinese song, obviously. Yeah. One thing that hasn't come up in the last uh, probably month now since we've known each other is a desirable career in singing, Grace. Have you kept something from me? Oh yeah, I'm 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 talented in many ways. Cannot wait to hear it. <laughs> Cannot wait to hear it. So guys, the mic is yours. There's so much um, we covered at the festival and there's also lots that we didn't get to cover. Um, and yeah, as I said, so many people came up to you guys afterwards, just said they would love to hear more about your story. Um, and your authenticity, I think, overwhelmed and blew people away. Um, and that was one of the things I loved about you when I first met you as well. Like, what an incredible career, but you're so authentic and you're very real. And I think that's probably what brought us onto the topic of winging it. Well, it was, um, thanks also for, you know, you jumping in to help us out with that because we have sort of our, our stories that you know, it's always so difficult to kind of put a form to them. So thanks for that. You've really kind of managed to make it sound like it's something, you know, pretty professional and sounds pretty good. <laughs> I was like, can you write that, can I have that bio for, uh, you absolutely for me yep. later? He's too, he's too polite. <laughs> You're a fucking wicked chair. Oh, uh, here we go. Hey, thank you. <laughs> First one up. First swear jar. Swear jar is yeah, filled. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, guys. Um, I humbly accept. Oh. Um, but no, there's. It, it was easy. It was. It was very, very easy to pull together your bios, um, given the the legacy of your work. So please tell us more, um, Grace. I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, why don't we kick it off by, in the context of your um, incredible career, how do you think you carved out your niche in the fashion and luxury brand industry using the concept of winging it? What does winging it mean to you? What kind of tools and tactics could you uh, impart with other people? I was saying to Jason just yesterday that I've actually winged my whole career, my whole life. You know, I, I never had fashion training. I think people thought I did fashion design at Central St. Martins, but I didn't. I did graphic design. And even with graphic design, I wasn't very good at a computer. I, you know, I just wasn't very good with like technology, you know, still not good with technology. Um, I'll <laughs> agree my, with that. He's my tech support. <laughs> um, I think I just winged it through primary school, high school. I mean, I felt so many GCSEs that you can go back to my UK boarding school and, and, and ask them for a record. I mean, I felt every single I love subject. It. What was your favorite subject in high school? Uh, art, actually. Amazing. Even that, I wasn't that good at it. I think I got a C in my GCSE or something. But um, So this is what I mean about you can wing it through life, providing you're there at the right place at the right time. A lot of it has to do with luck, and a lot of it has to do with personality, more so than talent sometimes. E if you have a talent, of course, it's a bonus, right? Yep. A lot of people I know these days, they don't have much talent, but because they're very good with people, they probably get the job done or, 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 or you know excel in their career path. So I think personality is a very important part to have a great career, I think. How you deal with people, how you talk to people, how you get things done and how you, how you get your way by how you say it, I think is more important in some ways, you know? Um, so yeah, throughout my whole life, you know, primary school winged it, and then UK boarding school winged it, somehow got into you know foundation at Chelsea College of Art, and then wing it to get into St Martin's. Everything you know, but I think she fails to mention that she actually got 
first class degree honours out of all that. I right? have you know, no when you doubt to the in my very mind. Top of the pile, it's like oh, okay. I, I have no. You have to back it up with something. Yes, <laughs> it's not I, completely I don't want to brag. Empty. I don't want to brag. No, no, I brag all the time about that. Yeah. Yes, she does. <laughs> I get brag. on great. Yeah. You've got to I brag. brag. She always wants to so brag. much about it. it. We don't want to build anyone's expectations up too much by saying it's only down to luck and timing. No, right? you, no. you, as I said a couple of weeks ago, you guys have just raw talent running through your veins. It's um, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Could I jump back to primary school? So do you have any kind of evocative memories that jump out from that period? Anything that might have indicated you would go into the fashion um, or brand industry? Um, not really. I, I always thought I had very strange t- clothing taste compared to my sisters. I've got three sisters. My mom is a very super stylish woman. Um, so we grew up watching her just putting clothes together. But what's so fascinating about my mom is that she's colorblind. So she can't see, was it red? Uh, Greens, um, red she can't, orange, none of the sort of red family. Uh, Yeah, so Purples, anything, green she can't. Everything sort of appears grey. But her wardrobe is more like colourful, isi miyaki, you know, it's, it's, it's quite weird. Like how she pulls outfit together. And, and it works very well. Like every single outfit that she wears is, is like spot on. So I think that was my ground training since I was young, just watching her, right? Mm-hmm. Subconsciously, you know, all of us, me and my sister are all very stylish, but in different ways. Yeah. I felt that I was always very, my taste of clothing compared to my sister was always a bit out there. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they, they didn't understand why I would choose something, you know, to wear like that. and. So we're very different. I would say I'm the most adventurous out of all my siblings, you know, how I dress and all that. Um, Definitely judging by the uh, teenage pictures of Grace that we have at home. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's terrific. There's some good outfits in there. (laughs) Horrific. (laughs) 70s bangers. The first year year I went to boarding school, I think I was about 12 or 13, whatever and stuff, I had spiky hair on one side and then flat, kind of like a short haircut on like for the rest of the hair. I mean, why is that a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> because it is. Because you're brave and unique. I absolutely love it. Please put that on Instagram and oh follow up Oh my God, list. I can't. It's just too embarrassing. <laughs> we all have our faux pas from that period. I yeah. mean, we've all gone through, yeah, some, some questionable decades for sure. Um, there's two things. So two things I want to follow up with are jumping in a bit more into like how your mum put things together being colour blind how you were inspired by that but yet have your own kind of unique aesthetic um, so some of my favourite fashion icons Iris Apfel and Chanel talk about the difference between style and fashion and there is a distinct difference could I ask you what you think about that and what your definition between them might be you can be very fashionable by following trends right people always ask me oh um What's the trend for this season? I always say to them, don't follow any trends. You know, I mean, the reason that fashion have trends is because they need to sell, you know, it's very commercialized. But at the same time, you know, we're dictating, as a fashion editor, you're dictating what's going to happen in six months' time. So when normal, you know, when, when the day to day people come to me, oh, you know, you're a Vogue editor, what, what's in for next season? What should I buy? I'm like, don't follow trends, but buy things that suit you and buy things that's going to be long lasting. Um, so that's my, that's always been my key, and um, I, I, I think those icons are they're just like iconic, right? It's because they have their own style. Mm. I just don't, I don't encourage people to like copy other people, and yeah. you need to find your own groove basically. Um, but it takes time to de- to develop. Yeah. Do you think confidence is a part to play? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, when mm. you wear something, even like. It's my pet peeve to watch women that cannot walk in heels, walk in heels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, practice, practice. practice at home until you can run, you know, and, and then. Sarah Jessica you, Parker style. Yeah, yeah. You know, once you master it, then go out to the real world. You yeah. know, it's nothing worse than watching a woman cannot wear heels and just trying to like strut it down the street. I'm like, no, yeah. no. Just don't do it. Just no. don't wear them. Yeah. Um, and the second thing I wanted to talk about from that, um, a very um, defining period of your life, primary school. You talked about wanting to be a fisherman when you were um, at the, the markets with your dad in Hong Kong. Please tell me more about that. That sounds too good not to explore. Um, yeah, I, so I, I used to go to the wet market with my mum often and just watching like the, fi- the fishmongers like chop the fish off and, 
and descaling it and all of that, I was like, wow, this is fascinating. It was so fascinating. So it was a fisherman or a fishmonger you wanted to be? Fishmonger. A fishmonger. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, fishmonger. I love this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, it's just fascinating. I was like, how do they do it so fast? And I don't mind blood so much. Um, so I was like, oh, maybe that's something I should, you know, I should do, you know. It's got very <laughs> Quentin Tarantino vibes about it. <laughs> very. Grace there with a cigarette and a meat cleaver. Absolutely. Like oh my God, I love fish. it. I love that the filmmaker by the, is, is conjuring up this <laughs> yeah, amazing yeah. scene that I can picture It's already in my there. Mind. It's like, yeah, I can see it all. It is so true. Yeah. It is so true. You in definitely got, because I've um, just finished watching um, Beef with um, oh, Ali, Ali, Ali Wong. Wong. Yes. She is amazing. And you remind me so much of her, just the sense of humor and the, the fierce, the yes. fierce, um, uh, confidence yes. and authenticity as well. Yeah, I so love yes, that. I think you should be auditioning for the next uh, Tarantino movie. Oh, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be like, oh, not her. <laughs> um, so moving on, you've gone through primary school, you end up in London, um, and I know you're saying you're winging it, but do you think there was a benefit to studying a complementary kind of skill skill set, such as graphic design, rather than you know, something that was kind of um, focused in on the on the fashion industry itself, or oh. even rather than studying something like commerce or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. I think coming from a different field, you always get the benefit of a different different angle, right? Mm. So when I, and it, w it worked really well when I went into Vogue, because I was able to, to like discuss with my art director in terms of layout, you know, in terms of like fonts, you know, I don't really like this font, and can you change it? And, I guess some of the ad fashion editors wouldn't probably care, mm. but I care too much because I'm so anal. Um, so yeah, so I think it's just a different way. It, it's like a film director, right? If you work, you know, with you know, if you if you're like a light lighting director and then also like a script writer and also like um, you've worked in costume de department, then you know everything to a T, and then you can apply um, to master your skill. I think it's super helpful to come from a different area. Absolutely agree. So speaking of going through the different areas, you've also mentioned that you started from the very, very beginning at the, maybe it wasn't quite the bottom of the ladder, but maybe it was. Talk, oh, it was. Talk us through the different kind of departments you worked in. What were your highlights and what were your, oh you my know, God. those you loathed? I think I, I, I steamed close for about two and a half years at the beginning of my career. And what happened was second year at St. Martin's, um, Terry Jones, who used to own ID Magazine in London, he came to give us a talk and I was very naively to, you know, I went up to him afterwards and said, oh, you know, Terry, I wanted my own magazine. Um, I was kind of so naive, but kind of like big headed about it. And he was just kind of looking at me going, kiddo, you have no idea, <laughs> you know? And then he said to me, oh, you, you look like you know how to dress very well. You know, do you want to become a stylist? I'm like, what's that? So then he said, you know, come and intern for me. So I went to ID as a editorial intern which means you have to do everything. You have to do, I think my first job was to do returns, which means mm -hmm. um, every photo shoot, you know, they have like um, press samples that you borrow from designers, PR, and you have to return it after you shoot with them. Mm -hmm. So that was my first first thing I, I did at a, as an intern for ID Magazine. So did, I, did you keep anything? I don't think you were allowed. I think they were no. Because, <laughs> because if a five oh, five dollar uh, five thousand pounds bag would go missing, it's definitely me that yeah. stole it. Um, <laughs> And then, so I did that for, how long did I do that for? Like maybe half a year, I think, towards the end of my degree. And then when I graduated with a first class degree honor, thank you. Um, Woo -woo. And he actually um, offered me to be his PA. He's never had a PA. So he was like, would you like to become my PA? I declined, which in hindsight, I should have taken it. Um, that would be my really quick way to get into, you know, like a full-time job. Mm -hmm. But I was very um, kind of proud and thought, oh, I'm not going to be your fucking secretary. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Second season. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and then, um, sorry, people don't know that I just swear again, so I put like another you know, coin in the swear jar. Um, so then I said to him, I'm not going to be your PA. Um, I want to do creative stuff. So he was like, okay, just, just come and intern for us then, you know. And then... I kind of regretted that I that that I turned that opportunity down, and then someone else got the job, and then through that job, she was able to do like you know editorial shootings as as well as like being his PA, and I was like, oh, that 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 would have been me, that that could have been me, you know, and I, I think for for 
for quite some months, just watching someone took my job, that was quite hard to swallow. So hard pill to swallow. We've we've talked about those um, occasions in your life where whether you turn something down or take something on and it doesn't work out either way. Yeah. That sense of like retrospectively looking back, kind of having those regrets I should have or I would have, uh, whatever it might be. Um, but yet when you see where your path did eventually take you, there's maybe an element of fate playing out that you were meant to go on a different pathway. Do you think that might have been true of that position? Like what did you do instead of taking on that PA role? Um, so I was still as an uh, editorial assistant for quite a while, for like at least a further another a year and a half. And then through that, I met Edward Enningville, who was the fashion director then at ID. But he was, um, he was a fashion director at large because he travels a lot and then he was already really big in the fashion industry. So he didn't really have to be based in the office. So that he would come in and out sometimes and I met him and he liked me. So then by the time his assistant left, you know, his office called me saying, can you come for an interview? And then I got the job and then he flew me to Milan two days later and we did the Dio Sanders show and I've never done such a big show in my life. I've done like smaller shows in London. Mm. So it was such an eye-opening experience for me because the scale you know the the budget and then I was in the same room as Mutual Prada you know Mr. Botelli who both of them own Prada and and Joe Sander and everything so it was it was quite it was quite a shock to be thrown a deep end so quickly um just from an intern you know and an assistant for like a few years and then to that and then Suddenly, you know, Naomi Campbell was calling me on my mobile asking about something. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so weird, you know. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Um, look, people often say, you know, all of these celebrities are just humans. Um, was that true when you were in that room with them or was there a lot of ego going on as well? Um, I think fashion people have a, a lot of huge egos, including myself. So I can't really say, oh, that celebrity is, you know, got huge. I mean, we all have. Um, there's definitely like a bit of hi hierarchy, you know, when it comes to like who's bigger, who's more famous, mm -hmm. all of that. And um, but egos on a spectrum, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but because of Edward, they were super nice to me, obviously, because you know he's he's a big figure in, in the fashion industry, and I think I got I probably got um, uh, a very easy introduction to all these supermodels, you know, people because I was Edward's assistant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, amazing. So you did get the express lane too. Oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. the word yeah. I was looking Case, for. Sorry, yeah. it Case wasn't. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, because look, I think I think everyone could identify with those moments where they're like, God damn it, why didn't I do that? Whatever that thing was. Insert X here. Um, and it's very easy to dwell on or, or go into that darker space and think, you know, how life could have been. But yeah, I think if we unfold that narrative and yeah, look at it from on high everything really does happen for a reason and maybe it's part of that whole winging it narrative which I think as we talked about is a lot more maybe not so much faking it but like facing you know your future headlong um kind of in, into the tailwind and taking the knocks getting back up again making sure that you just do that repeat process of getting up and facing the world one more time Jason I know you have a few kind of stories up your sleeve um on that one if you want to uh Tell us any. Uh, yeah, I mean, much the same as Grace. You know, my whole career did begin out of winging it, like, and it was out of ego and arrogance and all the rest of the good things that go along with it. You know, you gotta, you gotta take the chances while they're there. And I don't know, you're always gonna screw them up somewhere along the way. But um, yeah, that's exactly how you know all of my work got started as well. Was was simply. Um, Where did it all having start? enough ego to just walk in the door or somewhere and just go, I'm here, you know, and yeah. not that that meant much at the time, but it was kind of for some reason, much like Grace's story, is that someone just kind of goes, okay, I'll give you a shot, Don't you know, a and but hold on, hold on, rewind. You need to tell people how you go into the fashion industry by being a model. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, no, okay. Model, uh, you know what I mean. Are you like really, really good looking like Zoolander? It's hard to be really, really good looking. <laughs> oh my God. Please. So he was, he was a model, like 
blue blue stealing for, <laughs> for how long? For a few years now. Oh, one of you. One year. It didn't anyway, last were you long. spotted on the street on no, like, Hay, like Hay Street in Perth? Like, or how did it happen, Jason? Your mother sent a picture. No, I <laughs> expose. <laughs> no, I actually don't. How did I? Um, good question. You start off. You're not that old. No, probably (laughs) got in through a friend of mine, actually, a friend who was a model, and then I just happened to be hanging out with him one day, and he he went into the (laughs) agency, and then yeah, so I kind of was like, oh, all right, let's kind of see there, you know, there's lots of kids my age. I was probably only what seventeen or eighteen at the time, or so. So, um, yeah, they said, do you want to, you know try this I was like sure why not you know for no other reason just uh just to give it a go and I was terrible at it I was so so bad and why um, break it down because I'm he's just a shy person I'm just genuinely an introvert you know what I mean so you know having to perform in front of a camera is kind of my worst nightmare so yeah that that's kind of my love for it was not very big it probably lasted about six months. Um, but then he did get the Trisadi campaign. Yeah. Ooh, mm-hmm. tell us more. Uh, well, I... I'm trying to dig out the pictures yeah, yeah. so I can post it, but he won't let me. <laughs> no, <laughs> that like one. My blackmail <laughs> That was definitely going to stay buried. Um, yeah, you know, probably, as Grace said, did one job that was of any note, and then the rest I, I think I told a photographer to go fuck himself once, and then oh, that, that was kind of the end job. of it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Theo's yeah, gonna, our just, son's gonna be so rich after this. Yeah. <laughs> what does each uh, seed equal in, in financial terms? <laughs> Don't tell him. <laughs> one, one p, one cent. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that and I was just pretty terrible at it, and that's not because of anything other than you know my inability to kind of yeah, it just just yeah. be on camera, and that's why I sort of prefer the other side because it's just not my. And was it at that point that you did kind of nurture an interest in being on the other side of the camera or would that come later? Uh, no, well, the kind of beginning of, I was sort of, my head was already in photography mode um, long before that, like even as a, I think we sort of spoke about it briefly at Emergence that, um, you know, coming through as a kid is like, not quite figuring out. I knew I had this, you know, language of my own, which didn't really fit into a lot of other boxes, and mm-hmm. as every every kid does. And um, it was kind of trying to figure that out. It was kind of like, what is this? You know, this kind of background. I always had this instinct in the back of my head, going like, Oh no, you're supposed to do something creative, but I didn't know what that creative was. So it was was always just floating around. So I was pretty reasonable at school. Everything mm-hmm. was fine, but wasn't satisfied with any of the academic pursuits, you know, as yeah. a as a sort of teenager and going to university or whatever, I was just like, I no, finished school and I was like, I don't know what I wanted to do. So, um, yeah, I ended up just by luck, a, a friend of mine who was the model, and we used to just hang out a lot together. So, uh, yeah, I would sort of take pictures of him and just generally my friends, you know. Mm. And a lot of working taking photos was just yeah recording friends and mates and you know yeah being silly doing Um, what you do absolutely and I guess figuring out your style amongst that yeah I I think it it did come down to um yeah cinema was was sort of the bigger inspiration more than anything you know sort of seeing those super cool directors and Hong Kong directors like Wong Kar Wai and um and then seeing also the work of Wing Sha who was the the photographer who worked with Wong Kar Wai, which fast forward many years later turns out to be one of Grace's best friends. So, you know, there was sort yeah. of this funny link of all Fate. the people that, yeah, that we'd met along the way. And then one day, um, you know, a job turns up in Hong Kong and they say, oh, well, you can use Wong Kar Wai's team to do the job. And I'm just like, how does this happen? You know, like sort of you get to work with your icons along the way totally mm. by accident. So... Um, yeah, it was funny. I, I never thought about photography so much as a career. It was just sort of, you know, stumbled along the way until, um, what was the turning point? Um, 
So you, when Trisa- when Trisadi didn't call back, you're like, okay, yeah. I need to do something else. We, we need to pivot. We need to pivot. So you're talking myself. teens, right? When you're, you know, venturing into the modeling world, figuring yeah. out it's not quite for you. Yes. So you're still late you teens. St- still late teens, taking up the, f- the the camera kind of thing. What 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 age were you when you left Perth? Because you were you've mm, lived longer 19? out of Perth, isn't that right? Than you have oh, here. Much, yeah. much longer out of. I uh, probably left when I was about nineteen. Um, what happened? Just. You know, lots of random part-time jobs, you know, and really funny, hilarious. I'm like, how did I get this job? And, and again, they were all jobs through friends and all the rest. And mm. one of them was working in a Disney store. I was like, how did, you know, how did I end up here? It was, I was on the night shift and you would just, you know, bring your cans of beer and everything else and stick them under the counter. It was, it was like sort of that show Clerks, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that that yeah. movie. Um, so... Th- there were lots of really funny random things and then working in restaurants and bars and whatever else. And Yeah. Because um, I was always food obsessed too. That's my other creative outlet. So between the two of them, uh, I almost became a chef. So that I remember the day, you know, having the choice of the restaurant owner that I would sort of, uh, the place that I was working was like, well, if you want to be a chef, I'll make space for you in the kitchen and we'll kind of fund you to, you know, to do your training and um I was like yeah it sounds like fun but no I'll still follow this other road that I hadn't even figured out what it was yet it yeah, was just still the road less traveled yeah I didn't understand what that road was going to be yeah. um but just I just as well. trusted otherwise you would have missed out on all, all this exactly. I know imagine mm-hmm, when mm-hmm. you really think about you know just that one or two things that were you know could have been one or two degrees left or right and you yeah. wouldn't and you wouldn't have met Grace um yeah exactly Theo wouldn't his be lost here. <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously <laughs> Um, so look, I'm pretty sure there's probably a lot of padding in there that you haven't covered, but you've, you know, in, in between that kind of the 19 year old model and, yeah, the, cur- and the current day uh, accomplished photographer, there is an immense amount of, I'm guessing, you know, exploration of film, um, you know, working in the fashion industry, working with other industries, kind of what are some of the highlights that you could share that you probably think you know, contributed to the acceleration of your career um, and that may be some examples of, of winging it from your perspective. I think a lot of, um, because, you know, the fashion industry is is just a straight up social kind of industry. It's, it's how everything gets done. It, it is your sort of currency in a way that, you know, every job that you do, every person that you meet becomes part of your future. Like it's all sort of, interwoven that and because they're really short-term interactions as well Mm. it's not like you know say you go into finance again you'll meet a whole bunch of people who will help your career but you're in that job for three or four years before you make the next step Mm. whereas in the fashion industry that next step could happen in a week or two months or you know however long but um so it's kind of fast moving like that so when you when you kind of make those moves and you jump, you really too just have to back yourself. And granted, you never know what, you n- really never know what you're doing until you get put on the spot and you're having to make things work. And yeah. even, um, you know, moving into <coughs> the, you know, working internationally and stuff like that, it's like, how do you begin that? I don't know, you just start it by accident and, and somehow you find yourself getting jobs from, you know, people across the world who m- might have seen your work or mm. if you're lucky, uh, yeah, someone calls you up, which is even an, a nicer way, which, you know, did sort of happen. The international call came from some from a work. Uh, we spoke about uh, Jamie Oliver when he was in Sydney. So I shot some pictures of Jamie, sent them off to the magazine, thought nothing about it. Mm-hmm. Um and then it took seven years for that phone call, you know. So it kind of do- didn't happen overnight, but it did eventually come around um, much, much later. But in that in that sort of seven-year period, I was, again, I'd sort of started working for Vogue, um, shooting for them. So I was kind of prepping myself almost for the international stuff, mm. just in Sydney, um, yeah, shooting a lot for Vogue with kind of, you know, the highest level of, talent that I could find in in Australia and you know some of the other international people who 
were in Sydney at the time, so I'd sort of keep working and keep working and building it up. And, yeah, you get the chance to to wing it, even at every level. It doesn't matter whether you're at starting level or whether you're at a top level. You're always kind of winging it to the next bit as yeah. well. So just having that confidence to sort of just go, hey, I'll back myself. I'll absolutely, give it a shot. Absolutely, and yeah, yeah. pray and hope it kind of comes off, yeah. <laughs> you know. And look, Sometimes it doesn't, and that's kind of fun too you know? yeah it is and you learn something from it yeah maybe not immediately but in hindsight yeah. <laughs> the How golden glow of hindsight look I, I'd love to know what you guys think of I'm a firm believer in um you know those drivers of ambition that drive that sense of winging it that oh. confidence as you said in showing up knocking on the door and putting yourself forward for something um some might say it's ego but I completely agree with you Grace it, it takes ego in in the very essence of of the original word like it's essentially part of your personality right and it takes that that sense of becoming yourself and um uh embracing what is uniquely you and individually you to package it into a bit of a personal brand and and put yourself out there and you might not you'd like we have all of these words these catchwords today to explain this but probably when we're all young in our teens we didn't know what the hell we were doing we just kind of naturally had it because i've not to not to put myself in the same category, but I did. I've had so many people just say, uh, you know, I'm going to do this for you because I admire your tenacity. <laughs> and yeah. I.e. Yeah. not giving up and not taking no for an answer in the yeah. most diplomatic way possible. I'm like, if you can be just subtly annoying enough so that someone says yes, even if it's just to get rid of you, it's a success. So could I ask you guys both what like what do you think your drivers of ambition are? Where do they come from? Is it? nature is it nurture is it a combination of friends environment what do you think i don't think i have enough drive yeah me either <laughs> maybe that's a problem <laughs> actually we're quite similar in some ways yeah. like i wish i had more yeah just, me yeah. too actually um but do you I think, think that's just now do you think that like you've just crammed so much into the last kind of decade plus of your lives because there's no way you get a cv like yours without having that sense of ambition i think the the difference being is when someone designed or created their, their career path right from the start all the way to for like, I don't know, 10, 20 years or whatever and stuff. I mean, you, you, I, from my perspective, like you can always, you, you can't design your career path, so to speak, but at the same time, you can gear it towards the direction, right? Yeah. I think I'm a prime example of not having a plan and it worked out, you know, like, surprisingly mm -hmm. and that's why sometimes I kind of feel if you created your career path so much that you can make things happen whether it was going to happen or not it might have happened anyway but you just take an expressway giving it a shortcut rather than let it faster to when it's ready I mm -hmm. think that's a difference between that some people have you know the knack of doing that and speed it up I don't think I have that or I did but I was just naive enough to go up to people and go, hey, can I do this? You know, I want to do this. Can I, you know, can I be your assistant or whatever? I think that's the difference. When I was younger versus now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to approach people now because, you know, I'm like 51 now. Of course, you know, I can approach anybody. But in my 20s and 30s, I think I was more, is, is probably especially in my third, uh, 20s, I was very naive to go up to people thinking they could help me or they would help me because I'm just a nice girl, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I learned that actually, a lot of people are horrible in the fashion industry. There are some nice people, but nice don't get you that far, mm -hmm. which is quite disheartening sometimes. Yeah. Um, How do you build resilience around that? Oh my you God. Know? So you know that now after the benefit of years of experience, but is there any kind of, can, can, can anyone fast track if they're coming into their career in their 20s or something? Can you fast track or feign any sense of that confidence? Or is, do you think it act, you just have to go through the hoops of learning the hard way? I don't, uh, I mean, especially in, in fashion world, it is very much a personality based mm. business. 100%. Is that, 100%. you know, even when I'm on a shoot and I, the creative part is such a minute part of what, you do as <clears throat> you know as a photographer or um, fashion director is that you are kind of building a team and that team changes every single time and it's generally based around the client it's like 
who do I have to put in the room together on any particular day? Mm. And, you know, that's kind of where even your assistants will change day to day because you know that if I put this assistant in the room with that person, with that one, I'm just going to have a headache that I don't need. So it's kind of this constant process of just people managing mm. and, and knowing when yeah. and guiding the people who are on set with you to all get to the same point at the same time. So you're kind of just, you know, holding back a little bit here, waiting for the right moment for everyone to sort of just be together to get the shot at the right time. So it's, yeah, you spend a lot of time managing and just observing the room, just watching, watching it play out. You know, what comments these people have made, what they've said, what's going on. Mm. All those things are what makes a successful day on set, not so much the talent of the people, it's how you bring that talent together. Like you an know, anthropologist. It's a bit like a conductor of an orchestra. You know, you're kind yeah. of just pulling all these notes together until it sort of, yeah, becomes a great sound. Yeah, it's, it's definitely based on personality. Like, especially when you go on trips, you know, you want to, let's say you want to book a model and there's so many gorgeous girls and boys out there, right? But you want to go with someone for like a week to 10 days, someone who's really fun, who's like, who's going to get on well with everyone. You know, so personality plays a huge part in fashion, in the fashion industry. Mm. And it's an industry that we accept a lot of different types of people, whether you're gay, straight, you know, um, trans, non-binary, you know, we accept everyone. And even if you're like a scientist, a doctor, a lawyer, you can come and work in fashion. So it's probably one of the few industries that can do that and accept people who they are. And but has that been your experience right from the beginning, Grace? Or do you think that a lot of the kind of um, social campaigns that have happened in the last five years, five to 10 years, have enabled that sense of acceptance and um, inclusivity? I think fashion has all, you know, it's always been very inc inclusive, I think, but especially the past five years. I remember when I was at Vogue China, the first year we had this contributor from, from Europe there was a doctor who started writing, going to Fashion Week for us. And amongst all the fashion editor, you know, we're like, who the fuck is this person? You know, why is he like, you know, doing our job? And he's, he's not even in the field. He does, he's never written anything. He's a doctor. But because he, he was hanging out in the right party at the right time, and that's how he got the job. Hmm. So it was very like... Nepotism. So, oh, <laughs> completely. Sorry. One more swearing. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty empty jar, Grace. You do I know, I know. Um, <laughs> So, It'll be full, don't worry. So I think it's very much about who you know, who you party with. I mean, of course, I, you know, I make it sound like, you know, you don't need talent in fashion. Of course you do. Yeah. But it's the additional. Ad yeah. Additional. If you're a fun, like, that's why I learned so much from Edward Enningford, because he was such a fun person to be around, you know, for shoots and advertising jobs. And, and people just like being around him or being on set with him. Yeah. You know, and he's like super talented you know and he i think he was just born for this industry whereas someone like me I, I wasn't born in an industry to work in an industry because first i'm not like a diehard fashion person i probably don't even know enough fashion history because i never study it um and to be honest i'm interested to a certain extent mm. um so i can't really talk about fashion a lot I can talk about Formula One a lot. So, you know, it, it just goes to show that you have to be interested to wanting to know more, right? So I was never yes, yes. like a diehard person when it comes to fashion. I'm not, not like a fashion fashion victim or it's anything. It's not your number one passion, no, no. for example. Yeah, But yeah, I, yeah. I was lucky enough to be able to work in the field and then met all these great people. And then sometimes that's just the way how things turn out, you know, sometimes. Uh, absolutely. Trusting, um, trusting the process. I think that's kind of... Yeah, where it happened for me was even though I didn't know what was coming next, I just trusted that it was something was going to happen. And I, it, for me, it was always just an exploration of of what next or whatever happens next. And I didn't yeah. guide it in any particular way. Um, yeah, things lead from one to, one to another to another. But yeah. once you sort of start to get into that circle with recognised people mm. and working with them your reputation becomes everything like you know even as much as you can wing your way into that position you only get one shot if you fuck it up it's like that's on you and so you know that's kind of how <laughs> thank you um yeah you they'll give you the shot but 
you know, whether you it's can keep you the position you, yeah. is totally up to you. So yeah. that's you know, how it works. Call back. And for you, Jason, do you think, because um, you did get into photography very early, probably is still one of your passions. Oh. Do you think that might be tipped by your kind of your love for uh, food and kind of foodie culture? Or do you think photography and filmmaking are still your primary passions? No, I think they're still my, um, you know, my my main form of expression. I mean, no, okay, it's on equal par. Cooking and photography are still on equal. They've always been equal. There's never been a separation of the two. So, um, one one I can do very easily by myself, you know, on a daily basis. So I get a I get a really great creative outlet every day. Um, but then on the photography side, I was just kind of thinking about that today because I knew you would ask. But um, <laughs> on, I, I didn't even know I'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> on the photography end, it's sort of funny that I get really nervous on small shoots. But on massive shoots, I'm fine. It, it's kind of a weird... Why like the that? bigger the stakes, the more interested I get, the more I focus and... I don't know, just sort of the little small, can you just do this thing? I'm like, eh, that's to me, it kind of, yeah, freaks me out a little bit. But if you said, okay, there's going to be 50 people on set tomorrow and you've got to, you know, do this thing, I'm like, yeah, great. That's good. I'm ready. He yeah. said he's an introvert, but he's just fucking bossy. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You have Excuse the behind me? the scenes all access. Yes. Oh. Uh, so you want to get into working together, do you? <laughs> I love it. Another scene in the sweater. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's let's get in to working together. How have you made it work in the last you've been married now how many years? I don't know. I just don't I talk. Don't, I don't count. <laughs> I love it. Because I'm always he right. You don't count. Because <laughs> I have better taste <clears throat> and I'm always right. Happy wife, happy, I just happy exactly. life, as they yeah. say. Don't argue. No, we, we kind of work well together because we do, you know, a lot of our agreeing beforehand, before we even get on set. You know, we, we've kind of processed the shoot. We've sort of storyboarded. We've done all the stuff. We've had a lot of our difficult conversations before we've even, you know, arrived on set. So by the time we get to set, it's it's pretty cruisy a lot of the That's time. That's his version. It's I use a lot of threatening style. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, give us an example, Grace. And I pretend to let her be the boss. And it's kind of like, sure, we'll do Actually, it your way. you know what? I think yeah. it was such a shock to me when I moved from London to Hong Kong, uh, to Shanghai first, to work at Vogue China. Because the whole, the way they work is very different from how I was used to, you know, how I used to. Um, so when I first moved from London to Shanghai, when Vogue China started initially, and then two years later, we moved to Beijing. I was like, because in, in London, I was trained by Edward Enningfor, right? And I've worked with all these elite, you know, like magazine people, whatever and stuff. For example, like, you, you know, you do like um, a shoot for Italian Vogue for 10 pages, you will have like 20 rows of clothes. Wow. You know, at least, at least, mm -hmm. right? So when I w first moved to Shanghai, I would say, you know, um, I would request like samples for, from designers, you know, from the, from the PR team for each designer to 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 bring to the folk office so I can choose and all of that. People thought I was making a film because I would do like eight, eight pictures. I would call in like 20 rows of clothes and there's not enough to go around for all the other magazines. So they're like, who the fuck is this Grace Lamb? You She's know? such a prima donna. What yeah, so they thought I was being such a, demanding bitch you know but I wasn't I was just so used to that kind of working you know I just didn't understand how you can shoot a eight page stories with like 10 outfits that's what they did back in those days you know 2005 I so was like, who gave in did, did they acclimatize to your way of working of or vice versa of course they did of course they did because you know You've it was Vogue China of being yeah. the leader eh? yeah because it was Vogue China I mean I'm sure if I came from like a really tiny magazine they wouldn't give a shit you know but um yeah, so so I think all the PR were like, who the fuck is this Grace Lamb? You know, why is she so demanding? Sorry, oh, yeah, so there was three. <laughs> why um, did she curse so much? Yes. Um, so then I think they started adding more samples to each, you know, from for, for all the designers and then bringing more. I, I think by then, um, China opened up so much that they, they kind of realizing what they need to do in order to elevate the whole fashion scene, right? Yeah. And what was I saying? Oh, working together. So do you remember that? Oh my God. Do you remember that shoot that we did with that model that was kind of like a dead fish? 
Yeah, sure do. So we, it was our first, was that, was first that our one, first, first shoot? Oh my together. God. So it was our first shoot together. So you'd met already and met you had already, already asked Jason to pull his pants down his, when he yeah, came to yeah. show you his portfolio. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I was really busy oh, that day oh, I, like, seeing like photographers, makeup artists, hairstylists, you know, and I'm the kind of person that I see everyone because I remember when I started out in London, I went to see um, this really big stylist from uh, in, in a really hip magazine mm. and her name is Katie, Katie Grant. I don't know her, I've only just met her once. I remember her, um, making an appointment with her over the phone and she, she accepted it. So by the time I went to Days and Confused magazine, I showed up and she just said to me, I've got to go, like right, right there when I was there. And I'm like, but surely I'm here. And I did say to her, I said, as I'm here now, can't you just look at my portfolio? She was like, no, and then she left. So I was like, wow, that is so rude and really mean, you know, because I'm already there. Why can't you just look at it and pretend something, right? So I remember that day so well, and I swear to myself that I would never do that to anyone because you're giving people like hopes, you know, to enter the yeah. industry. And you don't know that might be the next Grace Coddington or that might be the next Stephen Mizell. You know, you're just missing out, you know, by not yeah. giving this person five minutes of your time. What is five minutes to anybody, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So then when Jason came in to the folk office, I was so busy that day. And then I think we were, he was the last person that I was meeting. And he walked in, you know, in his like Italian, like, you know, style. I'm like, ooh, who's this cute boy? But of course, and because of, he's a photographer, I thought, oh, he must be gay, you know, working in the fashion industry. And then surprisingly, his portfolio was pretty good. I was like, oh, not just a pretty face, you know? So then he left and then, um, my beauty editor came back to the office and I was like, oh, you just missed a photographer. He was really good. He was really good at beauty. So then she called him back and he came back again. And then I think it was like six months later, we started shooting our first shoot in Hong Kong together. It was like a jeans, uh, like a denim story. And then we cast this girl who's who a really beautiful face, but because, we, because she didn't live in Hong Kong, I couldn't see her in person. I just went with her comm card. Oh my gosh. That was she, the problem. Yeah, that was a problem. So for anybody out there, you need to meet the model in person and cast them for real, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> all the pictures, is very deceiving. Yeah, all the pictures were photoshopped. So the girl turned up, she looked nothing like the pictures in her book. No, so but also she couldn't fit yeah. into the sample size, yeah. I think. And she, you know, she couldn't, she didn't know how to move. She didn't, I mean, I'm a better mother than her. I was like, oh my God, you know. So as a, as a stylist. An example of winging it not quite working. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Sometimes. But, Bless. But Jason was, because I was, it, it was such a different way working in London compared to Hong Kong and, mm. and China, that what I found when I moved to Hong Kong um, two years later after Shanghai, the photographers there, they, they don't know too much about May hair and makeup, they just know technical side of, of photography. So Jason was the first person that I worked with, actually knew a lot about hair and makeup, which was so refreshing, because that was my job, you know, mm. to like kind of control everything. And, and because my, the photographers I worked with in Hong Kong, they didn't know that much, I have to take control as well. So I was doing like five people's job, you know? So mm. not only I have to produce all my shoots, do the styling, you know, hair and makeup, I have to give references. And so they're not very proactive in Hong Kong in that sense. Okay. Um, so that was quite, quite like a training for me to learn as well, you know, that like, I have to take on more roles, you know, I'm not fucking hell, I'm not paying enough for this, you know. Um, and so when I've worked with Jason, it was swear so refreshing. Jar. Sorry, swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> um, Won't take long. Theo's going to be, be so rich. Um, so when we worked together, it was so refreshing for a photographer to know so much about hair and makeup and not only like he knows so much about photography, you know, and lighting. I was like, oh my God, at least I can breathe, you know, for a bit. But then of course we had this model who didn't know what the hell she was doing. Um, and you don't want to be mean about it because she was new, right? So you just have to nurture them and teach them. And I think everything was cropped, you know? Because you couldn't <laughs> fit to any- <laughs> We had to kind of just do what you could do just to get through the day. She just was... wasn't in the final edit whatsoever. No, there was a lot of photoshopping <laughs> that happened afterwards too. No, but she also couldn't um, fit into the sample size. Yeah. So that was that kind was of difficult. All. It was a very difficult day. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a very long day and then um, eventually, you know, had a um, huge drink afterwards. <laughs> and that was and the was start of a, a beautiful affair to remember. No, but that was the start of your 
uh, what sounds like a very complimentary working relationship. Yeah. Um, would you say that about your personal lives as well? Do you think that you just kind of support and hold each other and make space for each of you to be yourselves individually, but also obviously a very um, supportive network for each other in the yeah. professional environment. Do you still do you still I work on a lot of shoots together? Yeah. Yeah, mm. as often as possible. Not not since we've been in part. I mean, we worked yeah. in a few things together. But um, we used to do a lot more video content stuff for social, mm. um, just like really fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, life just took over and then, you know, in Perth we don't have a full-time nanny anymore. So, you know, so it's just difficult juggling with kid and kid stuff and then work stuff. But uh, I was gonna but say But yeah, something. we're pretty, well, we're complimentary in terms that we're completely the opposite of each other. Oh you yeah. Know, like it sort of yeah. that Opposites sort of track. Yeah. It's, it's it's definitely We kind of fill in each other's blanks really, you know. Yeah. All, all the I bits forget. that I'm shit at that you know for Grace is amazing at. For people who don't know me, I'm a very feisty Chinese woman, right? Agreed. And a and a, and a true feisty <laughs> Chinese woman. <laughs> with with a Londoner attitude, you know, because I lo- lived in London most yeah. of my life. So I don't think any man could take that kind of role. So if, they don't ha- if they don't <laughs> have the patience and the nerve, you know? Yeah. Because I don't hold back. Uh, if you fucking what's, piss what's me Jason's off, What's Jason's breaking point? What, what do you know will push him over the well, Grace is the only person who can find it. It's oh, like, yeah. It doesn't come out very often. He, he, he doesn't get angry. The only person that is capable of that is me. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's true. Yeah. I'll agree with that. It's our prerogative as women, uh, Grace. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask... Um, a question that we didn't quite get into as well a few weeks ago, just digging beneath the surface a bit more about yeah. the the kind of, I hate to dwell on the fashion industry, but, you know, it is all encompassing. It's not just about the clothes. There is so much, as you say, the commercial environs within which it operates. Um, and let, let's even tack on the film industry as well. There's been so many kind of, um, you know, the Me Too campaign, everything that's come out of that space in the last few years has been revolutionary in a good sense, I yeah, would say. Absolutely. Um, but it, it does call to probably a level of you know, where perfectionism can become toxic and, and kind of the cultivation or, or enabling of a, a toxic environment within which working over an extended period of time can be very damaging to one's mental health. Um, do you think, th- did you see that side of the industry? You've definitely highlighted the, uh, some of the amazing um, life-changing benefits, I would say, of working there with amazing people. But did you see the other side, the darker side of the moon, so to speak? Um, and how did you kind of navigate that at the time? Yeah. It's hard as a woman to be in the fashion industry because everyone's so beautiful, right? You know, I mean, I'm five foot five and then you're working with like, you know, five, 11, six foot models who are like tall, beautiful, skinny, and they're like, you know, lovely people, right? So I think at one point I was actually quite jaded because I was like, why am I working my ass off? You know, always the last one to leave, first one to arrive. And I have shit loads of things that I need to do, really tedious thing. And models would come in do their stuff, strut the thing, and then they get paid thousands and thousands of pounds. You know, I was like, where's the justice for this, you know? And I, I got quite jaded when I was an assistant, just l- watching everything like that. But then at the same time, I think I was, you know, I think, how old was I? Like in my late 20s, early 30s, around that time, I think. Mm. A little bit older, so then because of my my natural nature i'm i'm quite good at like just like oh you know like, screw that you know uh, and i would just go and have fun with my friends instead and then trying to like brush it off and stuff but if you're not that kind of person you take it into heart if you're an introvert it's going to kill you it's going to mm. eat you up because it's just it's really it's a really tough industry to be it's a lot of rejections especially if you're a model right mm. um so you know for young girls it's very difficult and and also to as an assistant, just to watch people to earn so much money when you're just an assistant, you're, you're earning nothing, you're mm. like, oh, why am I doing this? I, you know, for me, I was, there were so many moments when I thought, I don't even really like fashion. Why am I doing this, you know? But I just went along with it because I thought, oh, it's fun. It's, it's actually such a fun industry to be yeah. in. You know, the every fun day, part sucks you in. Yeah, the fun part sucks you in, you know, mm. and, and it just makes you carry on, you know. and But you just have to... I think you just have to take it as a pinch of salt and yeah. then just not let it affect you. Yeah. And I mean, I guess for me, because I have a resting bitch face, I never got like sexually harassed. I never got any of those. Um, but it happens, you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think look, there's definitely, you know, there's obvious cases of bad behavior, but, you know, that happens in 
all industries, mm. I think. I was um, just going to say, exactly, it does. Yeah, no more other or no less than any other, I think, is, is just part of it. But I, I think also... Um, now I've totally forgotten. He's got perimenopausal I've cringing. got Grace's brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's catching. Yes. Um, it's interesting to hear that. And I think, mm. you know, probably comes back to not everything you read in the media can be taken at face value. Um, oh. But it, it, it probably weaves very nicely into your answers to other questions yeah. around, you know, it is up to you how you kind of take something and process something, having a thicker skin, building resilience to the extent of which, you know, something is... Uh, acceptable behavior you know yeah. not that not that I'm, we're advertising or advocating for anyone to put up yeah. unacceptable behavior um, you need to have very thick skin yeah very very thick skin and if you're not born with thick skin how do you build it i think that um you know that process of calling people out on set when they're being dickheads that's kind of you know that's really important to uh can you do, do that as someone you know in a junior, junior role can you do that no no, mm, that sounds like a, a head uh, on the chopping what? block situation. <laughs> nowadays, if, nowadays you can, I think. Yeah. Nowadays, definitely you can, but not back in my days. No. I think if you're, that also comes down to, you know, the people that you're working for. If you kind of notice that that's going on and you kind of have the guts to mention it to them and they do nothing, that's a good sign to get out. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like yeah. you just don't want to be in that working with people who let it happen you know like it, it's always a case that you you have to kind of monitor that and keep track of it and i don't know is it building a thick skin or not? but also also i think who you work for is very important yeah. who you choose to work for you know like if if um if you work for someone who's got like you know morals and all of that and stuff so you naturally you're going to be like the same you know Absolutely. it's no different than being a parent more. right you know, is that your my our kid is going to watch us how we behave by other people, and then he's going to react to that. So if you're like an asshole all the time, of course your assistant is going to turn out to be an asshole, and then and then and and then for the next few generations, they're going to treat the next few generations the same thing. So you know, I think it's really important. I mean, I'm not saying that I was always very nice. I was, I've had my moments with my assistants as well, but all my assistants in Hong Kong were like really good friends. And even now, you know, one my, one of my closest assistants, like called Gum Gum, love her to bits. We're so close now, you know. Whenever I have, you know, I want to vent, I want to talk about this and that, I always call her, and we, you know, we're so close now. I think you build relate friendship that mm -hmm. is so valuable. You know, I, I mean, at the beginning of the podcast, I said, you know, people here, fashion industry people are very horrible. There are many horrible people out there, but at the same time, you just you just need to find your group. Yeah, find your tribe. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's and easy, and, yeah. and I think what you what you drew upon is interesting, Grace, because okay, you said you've had your moments. Look, we've all had our moments, mm. right? But I do think if you have a strong moral compass, <clears throat> if you've a good set of principles and ethics yeah. that yeah. you live by and that is you said, Jason, you're not willing to compromise on, yeah. I just think that is gonna shine through and everyone has to I think yeah. uh, experience either being on the receiving end of someone losing it or losing it yourself because yeah. it's just part of human nature and everyone gets stressed. But yeah, I think if you can, as you say, when when you live by a good moral compass, your tribe will will be the same. Yeah, I think you know there's there's kind of a, a bit of a transition happening as well, which probably it, it that behaviour was more apparent before, but you know, with within the last kind of. I don't know, I'd say 10 to 15 years, that transition's been, fashion's become so much more accepting of everyone and everything. And the funny thing is that behavior you're talking about has now moved towards the audience, mm -hmm. like the influencer audience. And, you know, like yep. it's become a, a social problem rather than a fashion problem. Mm. It's sort of, it's moved its camp from, you know, that kind of, bad behavior and bitching about people I just find it less and less on on sort of fashion sets and with fashion people because they're just like now they just invite now they're everyone <laughs> yeah, they invite you know everyone into the circle but now that kind of sense of judgment has moved into social media yeah you know more yeah. so than it has been in fashion so I feel like there's a bit of a transition there that Maybe it's a case of, you know, we have to check our behavior on our devices rather than, I think when there's that keyboard and screen between you, people are just generally pretty nasty to each other. But 
you know, you, when they're standing in front of you, you're sort of, you're a whole lot nicer to them. Uh, it's very true. Keyboard warriors, mm. where do they actually get the time to s oh, to write those I things and say but, those but things? But those people are from the so other unhappy side of with their own screen. lives, right? Yeah. That's why they have to take it out on others, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think if you If can they're real in the first place, if they're mm. not chatbots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, the amount of, the amount of, of you know, I used to, but because I'm, you know, older now, I'm able to like cope with any like, you know, negative comments or, or people like hating me or whatever and stuff, which I don't get that often. But I think, when was it? I think when I was still living in Hong Kong, you know, um, I was doing a lot of like collaboration with brands or whatever and stuff, you know. I've had like DMs, people trying to like ignite a fight with me on, on my social media. And it's just kind of saying something, what was it? Oh, I think it was one year when um, Dolce Gabbana had a campaign showing this Chinese models using chopsticks to eat pasta. Mm -hmm. And it caused mm -hmm. a huge uproar in China, right? And then people were like burning the all the clothes and um, um, Dolce Gabbana shops. And then it, w it was actually quite serious. And I got um, a TV station in Hong Kong interviewed me about it. Um, I was very PC about it. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? I, I need to say what I, I want to say. Did they see that as cultural appropriation, Grace? Yeah, Is that yeah, what, yeah. What yeah, yeah, them? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, and also kind of making fun of Chinese people. I mean, to be honest, I've yeah. never, I've never seen a Chinese person using chopsticks to eat pasta. I mean, mm. it'd be ridiculous, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, it, was, um, it was pizza, wasn't it? They had a, like a, a big pizza or something. No, it was and pasta. They were trying to eat. Yeah. No. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, so then somebody I can't remember where kind of DM me and started a fight. Like, Who do you think you are? You're just like a little Chinese girl. And then, and then I'm like, a Chinese like. That person called me a Chinese white girl. I mean, just because I was I spent a lot of my time in London, I'm like, I'm like, what the hell are you on about? So I didn't even engage it. I just blocked this person and didn't engage it. And then I think you just need to learn how to switch it off, you know, instead of just like feeding into the beast. I think that's brilliant. Um, guys, I haven't even been tracking time. This is, no, I could, as I, I said, forgot. back on the stage two weeks ago, could talk for hours and I still could. But... We want to get to some very cool questions that have come through your um, Instagram accounts in the last few days in the lead up to this pod. Um, so either of you can answer, you jump at the chance. We're going to start with, what is your creative vision now that you're in Perth and has it changed since the move back here? Jason. Mm, that's a tricky one. Um, has it changed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what, you know, w the chance we've had since coming back here is we've just had more time, time to think and time to kind of explore and, you know, try and, and time to question what we've been doing and all the rest. So Hong Kong is such a hectic place that you're just on 24 seven. It's just always, always working. So um, to come back here, yeah, it was nice to sort of have a bit of breathing space and for us to explore lots of other different angles and, um, yeah, for me, it's kind of nice to um, start pushing more on, um, you know, environmental angles and education angles and those kind of things that had been floating in the back of my head for a long while. So, uh, yeah, just being able to loosen up our careers a little bit and still still do the photography work and, um, yeah, but just kind of play in other areas and, i love and, that yeah. i love that so play is so important so following on from that what is next for you um jason are you going to uh divert your career more in that direction in the filmmaking space um or, or what is next and not um yeah continuing on with pictures but i think um you know the re the reason for doing it kind of changes a lot over time as well you sort of you know find different reasons to tell stories and, and things like that. But um, yeah, I think becoming a parent and doing all that stuff, of course, changes perspectives. But yeah, f feeling increasingly sort of um, pushed to, I don't know, just help out wherever I can to find solutions for how we live going forward. And um, yeah, one of them uh, connecting up with uh, three other friends of mine and um, we are, sort of developing creative um, services for uh, a lot of uh, larger companies with all their ESG reporting and things like that. So every th all the work that they do with the environment, we sort of go in to sort of help them strategize, you know, how 
best to tell those stories to get you know those messages across and things like that so our key is you know definitely um yeah trying to bring environmental decisions further into the conversation rather than them being an add-on to oh we've got to do industry first and then we've got to tack on the environment at the end we're sort of trying to bring environment to the front of the conversation and into the strategy kind of you know promote the idea that uh the environment should be seen as a partner not a resource like it's kind of you know it's a different way of thinking about the future yeah amazing. Can't, can't keep mining it and thinking that it's kind of gonna still respond well, you're favorably gonna, you're gonna be very busy in this yeah. town um so that's driven one. by primary industries what's yeah. part two part two is a um well we, we've been sort of having a chat on this one for the last few years since we got here was um to develop a a huge kind of uh, tourism project and uh sculpture trails for western australia to uh yeah, kind of change the way people travel around the state uh, is kind of our our goal on that one. Is uh, change, change, change the change the journey to change the reputation of WA. You know, mm. I think you know as a newbie-ish person here. I mean, I see things very differently from people from here. So we've been here for a few years, and then when I first got here, I was like, you know, WA is such a lovely, huge place, right? Why are we not making use of like the land? And then. I went to Naoshima um, in Japan, which is like an you know uh, art uh, sculpture islands, you know, which is made up of like a few sculpture islands. And why can't we bring that here, you know? Um, but but make a, like a WA identity um, sculpture project, sculpture park project. So that's what we've been. I mean, doing creative work in Perth is not easy. It's it's got it's a lot of challenges. You know, if you're a creative person, because the pool's so small. You know, the industry is small. You know, there's so many jobs to go around for everyone, right? So you kind of, you either eventually might have to leave Perth and go somewhere else or East Coast, or you just have to find a way of, you know, surviving here, which we found post-COVID era. Um, So for me, um, I think because, I I mean, to be honest, if I can turn down Anna Winter for Editor-in-Chief Job of China, you know, I, I just need to do something that I really, really want to do, I've been wanting to do, and and making movies, storytelling, you know, writing my first script, that's what I want to do next. Um, so I've, you know, came in contact with some film directors, you know, picking their brain of how to enter the movie industry. And at Emergence, I met this amazing lady, um, what's her name, Shanti from Indonesia, who has her own film companies. And she gave me so many pointers about how to get into the film industry, you know, what I should do. And she gave me a really good point about I think she can see that I'm, you know, quite a humorous person and I've got my own, you know, like sense of humor and all of that. And then she said, you know, you need to partner a scriptwriter who's from UK rather than here. I'm like, ah, oh, good idea, you know. Interesting. So that's very interesting. And then, um, and also, you know, I'm a huge advocate for menopause because I'm going through peri- perimenopause myself. And I want to change the reputation of middle-aged women. And how am I going to do that? It's by helping them to style them in a way that are going to make them feel, you know, fresher, you know, more alive and boost their self-confidence. You know, I think the problem with the image of menopausal women is that, you know, we're very dowdy, you know, we're like past our prime and all of that, which is fucking bullshit. You know, I mean, like, for God's sake, people. Um, so I'm, I'm on a mission to help middle-aged women to revamp our image so that people can look at us as like we're as, as fab as we were in our 30s and 40s, you know. Um, and yeah, so that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to do that. We have two ways of doing it. One via Zoom, um, which is more like a global reach. And then one, which is a face-to-face starting session in Perth. So yeah, so that's, what, that's my next um, two things I want to do. Two projects. I love it. And I have no doubt that it will be two of many to come. But I'm um, very excited by everything that is on both of your agendas. Um, I'm going to jump to another um, IG question. Do you regret saying no to Anna Wintour when she called you, Grace? No. I don't. (laughs) <laughs> so for people who don't know what happened like, you wouldn't have seen grace for the last five years no, if she said yes no way um, that was the most important job of my life what happened was lighting lighting grace for oh a, yeah for a phone call yeah so we moved here and a, uh, a year later 
So we've been in Puff for a year. And then one day I saw on IG that my former boss, um, editor in of Vogue China, she announced that she was leaving. And then the next day my phone went nuts and I, keep, I, I kept getting calls from London. And then I realized that it was Edward Enningfall calling me. So he called me in and I called him back and I said, um, I said, hey, what's up? And he was like, can I give your phone number to Enda Winter? She wants to talk to you. I'm like, oh, okay. I kind of knew what it was about. And then Ed was like, you know, call me. You know, I will talk to you, I'll run you through, you know, um, it'd be great for you. And so I spoke to Anna and then we had a chat. We had a, we had a very quick chat about it. And I think at that point I knew I didn't want to move to China because we just landed in, in Australia. And also, you know, it was during COVID. So we didn't want to leave and I'm germophobic. So I'm like, there's no way I'm going to travel, get on a gross plane, right? Unless I sanitize the whole plane. And then we had a, a, a very quick conversation about it. And I kind of knew what my life would be like to be an editor in chief of Vogue China during COVID. I'm like, are you nuts? You know, no, no matter how much they're going to pay me, it's not going to be enough to justify the stress I'm going to go through. And also we didn't want to bring our kid up in, um, in China. So it was a quick no already before I even spoke to her. Um, so then the you know, Zoom call came and then I made Jason set up beautiful lighting so I look really good, you know. <laughs> and he was like, why the hell am I doing all this work when you don't even want this job, you know. I was like, because I need yeah. to be, you know, professional in front of Anna Winter via Zoom. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're I'll recorded, Paul. I, I do lighting <laughs> services for Zoom if anyone's interested. So anyway, <laughs> so back to the question. Um, no, I, I, it's one thing I do not regret so for for turning that opportunity down because I look at it as um it's it's better to say no to any winter so I can put on my grave rather than saying yes. <laughs> classic, <laughs> classic answer. But yeah. you know, I think I think when you when you're at a certain age, um, maybe if I was in my twenties or thirties, I would definitely say yes, or even in my early forties. Yeah. But not now when I'm in my fifties and then I want a different lifestyle and. And I'm more interested, and I said to Anna, I'm, I said, I'm more interested in any sustainable fashion project that you have rather than luxury fashion. Because, you know, very polluted industry. We don't need any more clothes, people. Come on. Very, very true. Um, Jason, what yes. do you look for in creative collaborations? Skill, talent, a vibe match, or all of the above? Um, probably a little bit of all of those. Um, more so vibe match and yeah, talent, skill. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think more, no, just people that you have the right kind of energy working with. Right vibe. Yeah, it's got to be just, you know, you got to set the right mood to work with people. You can't just kind of turn up and work with anyone because of, done that enough times to know that it doesn't work you know never works in your favor that's for sure you just go home a bit disappointed and and kind of annoyed and thinking about all the things that could have been or should have been but they mm. just weren't because you know um for whatever reason you just don't gel with the person you're dealing with so yeah yeah and, I would say. and have you seen like a direct um impact on the end result so that like example you're doing a portrait shoot yeah will you see the difference if you've had to work with someone that you didn't vibe with for yeah. that day versus a, an amazing synergy in the room maybe it just no maybe it's i'm sure the result would be very still would be great uh, but, no doubt with your skill but yeah maybe it's your memory of it that you take away that you sort of like something we attach a bit to it yeah, yeah. who's yeah. your worst person you ever worked with don't say me. Uh, in well, front or behind the camera? No. The, <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, like you, that was one of the questions that we never got to on the thing. But I, I figure that the worst person you've ever worked with is a bit like the Oscars. Like every year, there's like a new list of uh, you know <laughs> of people to celebrate. <laughs> you're like, yes, yeah, you're the worst. And it's like, but I actually. I don't generally have people like bad people that I work with because I on. I try and get to. I try and get to sort of almost know as soon as possible, as soon as I meet someone or whatever, I'm just like, okay, how do I just make this bad? Like, how do I get to a confrontation or how do I get to a difficult spot 
just to see how the other person will react. Mm. And, and then I'll, it's almost like a testing of the friendship almost. You just go, okay, I'm going to be really difficult right from the start and just see, you know, where it sort of finds a happy ground. And if, and if you sort of get to a point where it can survive some difficult conversations from the beginning, you kind of go, oh, actually this, you know, we are on the same page. So, because everyone's always really nice right in the beginning. Everyone's your friend, you know, <laughs> until you get to the sticky part. And it's like, like dating, right? Yeah. You know, you show up in your absolute best self for the yeah. first so I kind one of six hour. months if yeah. we're generous. I treat I love it like six speed months, dating. one hour. Yeah, exactly. You treat it a bit like speed dating. You're like, okay, I'm just going to find out this answer really quickly, and then you've got to have professional chemistry. Yeah, yeah. One of the worst person I've worked with was um, at the beginning, the first week when I was at Vogue China. Um, we were shooting the cover for Vogue China, and then Kareem Rockfall came over from French Vogue, you know, to shoot, and she was lovely. However, the team, the producer on that show, I can't remember her name. Um, so there were loads of people because there were like, you know, um, five supermodels and whatever and stuff. And then there were like some Chinese models. So the, the production was pretty big. And then one day it was like location every single day for like a week, right? And I remember one day we were at a, um, a restaurant, a really famous restaurant on a bun to shoot the, well, one, of the, uh, one of the shots. And um, Patrick de Rochelle was the photographer. He was lovely. So that came lunchtime, and then everyone was having lunch. There was no lunch for the whole of Chinese team. Nobody, wow, nobody rude. was allowed to eat with the white people. And wow. I was so shocked. Appalling. Wow. Appalling, right? Mm. And then I think... I think they didn't order enough lunch or something like that, or some of the some of the Chinese team members couldn't have any lunch. I'm like, that's shit. What the fuck? You know, you're in China shooting for China Vogue, using up budget, and I just went ape shit. I went up to my editor in chief and I said, this is not on. You know, I think it's very important to stand up for your own people, especially when something like that happens. And and I think she sorted it out. But what I mean about sometimes with you know, Westerners, it's like they come into China, they feel that they're so I, um, entitled, entitled to us yeah. and they feel like we're beneath them. And it was just so shocking to me. I was like, what the hell, you know, like I just didn't understand why you would do that to anybody, let alone, you know, judging judging by the color of the skin. And it, it was something that I was just like, what, what, what kind of year are we living in still, you know, to have yeah. that kind of like thinking and that kind of like behavior and just think it was okay. And because I call her out, she didn't talk to me for the rest of the week. I'm like, who the fuck are you anyway? You know, yeah, whatever, check, man. Check your bias. Yeah, yeah. seriously. You yeah. know, she just thought she was really nice to me like two days before. And then as soon as I sold her out, <laughs> sorry, Sergio. Just put um, a whole bunch. In I know. Place. Yeah, here you go. I'm going to put a whole bunch of seats in there. There you go. <laughs> Anticipating um, the final There's about 10 seats in there in the Sergio. Um, so I think sometimes people need to check themselves. Absolutely. You know, you're in other people's country and you need to like, put your ego down, put, you know, yeah. behave for yeah. God's sake, you Abs know? Absolutely. And even even more so wherever we are, right? Exactly. Especially when we yeah. travel, we are essentially visitors in someone else's home. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. wherever we are and, and land, 100%. Yeah. I think it's being patient. I think that's the key is being patient. Like even, you know, for me, uh, stepping into Hong Kong and even the, the guys who I used to rent all my equipment from at the production house, um, you know, I... I was there almost every day for like five years and they wouldn't talk to me at all. They'd just be like, you know, wouldn't give me the time of day. They'd be like, yeah, yeah what do you want? Here's your stuff, go. But it's funny because, and it, it took five solid years of seeing people every day. And then they realized they're like, oh, actually you're hanging around. He's you're not, not just here anywhere, for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> also because and you're a nice you, person. That's yeah. why, you know, the, the, the difference being mm. sometimes I feel like, with Westerners and, and when they come to Asia is that they feel like they're so superior over us, right? I mean, your situation with, mm. with the Rancho Pro guys is because maybe it's a language barrier, yeah. you know? Whereas, like, Westerner comes to China, obviously they don't speak the language, mm. you know? So, so they come in and they boss people around and all of that. I'm not saying everyone, but I see it a lot. When people come to China or come to Hong Kong, I mean, I've chased payment for my assistants in Hong Kong because... 
some you know like European photographer wouldn't pay my assistant gum gum that I spoke to about that I love. Mm -hmm. So she came on set one day. I was like, "What's wrong? You look so upset." And she was like, "I haven't been paid. I'm just trying to chase some payment." And I said, "What happened?" So she basically did a job, a shoot. She was a photo assistant and also、um, a fashion assistant. So she was on the set,、uh, like a Christmas campaign in Hong Kong with this European photographer,、mm. and it wasn't even that much money. It was like I don't know, two hundred pounds or three hundred pounds or something, right? He would not pay her. So I grabbed her phone. I said,、like, "Give me his fucking name and give me his phone number. I'm gonna call this asshole." She was like, "No, no, no, no! Don't do that." Because she knows what I'm like. You know, I'm like a reincarnation of Bruce Lee. I'm like, "Give me his fucking phone." So I put him on speakerphone, and I dialed it. Da 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 da. So I said, "Hi,、um, you haven't paid my.、Uh, you haven't paid gum,、um, gum gum. You need to pay her ASAP. I'm a very powerful person in the fashion industry right here in Hong Kong, and I will ruin your name within five minutes if you don't pay her." So he said, "Who's this?" You know, obviously because I don't have a Chinese accent when I speak English. So he thought I was like probably white. He was like, "You don't know how it works in Hong Kong. You know, you're not from here." No, 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 no. And I was like, "Doesn't matter where I'm from." He goes, "Who's this? Who am I talking?" To? I'm like, "Never you mind who I am. I'm Gum Gum's people. You pay within <laughs> the you pay within the ten minutes, or I'm going to call you out." So I hung up, and like meanwhile, you know, my assistant was like sweating, right, but kind of like laughing. Within, you know, I gave him half an hour to pay. Within twenty minutes, he pays straight away. You know, versus he he's been holding out her payment for like a month and a half. I mean, people, why why do you do that? You know, because you think that we're weaker than you. That's why. And also, I can't blame people as well. Like sometimes with Asians, we're too timid, we're too shy, and too like you know humble, whatever and stuff. I'm here to change all that. So fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> But I kind of, I kind of like, you know, the situation that I had with the big four seats. Yes, 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 yes. The situation I had with the production house there, I quite admired that. I was just like, no, you've got to earn your place, like in in this kind of dynamic in the industry. It's、yeah. like, you know, they're like, we see people every day.、Mm. It's like we're not going to, you know, bow down and be nice to you just because you turned up. It's yeah, like you yeah, prove、absolutely. that you're going to hang around and, and be a part of this industry, and then we'll talk to you later. And I, I quite like that. It's like you got to earn your stripes in there. You do, which is and、cool. the nature of kind of major urban hubs like Hong Kong,、yeah. like London, they're transient places.、Yeah. Like even Perth is can be a transient place. People、yeah. come and go,、um, and yeah, I think it's、uh, yeah. Probably, maybe they just have had to say goodbye too many times to people who,、yeah. who moved on. They, they were just unfriendly. That,、uh, they were just like, "Oh, we'll see if you stick around." Yeah, or not. you know, you so you earned your stripes. Yes.、Um, okay, I'm gonna have one more question, and I think this is for you, Grace. What is it about Formula One that you vibe with? Because you've just set up、um, an F, a private F1、yes. club. Is that right? I have, to, I have to thank Emergence. For that, because of emergence, I met so many Formula One fans in Perth. So it's been my dream to like have my own little like F1 club, and I'm able to achieve it here in Perth.、Um, so it's called F1 GTT. How do you join? You need to go through、um, a、you、survey. Through yeah,、her. I was going to say if、yeah. I know it, you've you've got at least you know what five to seven quiz questions、oh, that、yeah. you need、yeah. to get、oh, right.、Yeah. <laughs> There's like the Dorvich policy. Yeah,、It's、totally. Like, yeah. So it's called F1 Gibberish Trash Talk.、Um, so I will, if you want to join, first of all, it's like a referral policy, and then how many referrals do you need?、Uh, just one. Just you know, you verbal have, well, is okay. Verbal、yeah. or like you know, you have to know someone from our gang. Anyway, so then I will email you. <laughs> What's your gang called? It's very high school. <laughs> It's called F1 GTT. Just the F1 GTT.、Um, so then、uh, I set up my Instagram, and you know it's a private setting. You know you have to be referred. You know to join. So、um, I will ask you a few F1 questions, and if you pass, then I'll let you in. But if you're like an asshole, you have to go. So it's a lot of rules, but then no、yes. one seems to be having problems with it, so it's fine.、Um, How many、everything. members are there at the moment? There's 22 of us. Oh wow!、Mm -hmm. I love、mm -hmm. it. The underworld of F1 fans.、Uh -huh. <laughs> I do love though how everyone watched、uh, Drive to Survive last year and,、oh, yeah. and thought they were immediate, you know,、yeah. uh, professional critics on the topic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, most people because of Drive to Survive they've gone to F1. Even friends of mine from London or wherever, like they're like, "Oh my god, it's so cool! I can't believe you used to, you know, you started at 1997. I started." Watching,、um, you're the OG. I'm the OG,、100%. and I wanted to get into Formula One before I got into fashion. 
So, yeah. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I feel like that could be easily another half an hour of chat, which I would love to hear. Um, I think that sums up um, an incredible... Oh, I have one more question from IG that came in today. Oh. So someone asked Jason... Oh. What have you done to deserve such a brilliant, funny, Ah! wicked (laughs) wife? I was just going to think, I don't remember any questions Where coming through that after. That, yeah. that, that, that question's from me. <laughs> <laughs> we know, Grace. <laughs> yeah, what have you done in your previous life to deserve me? I mean, come on. Um, He's pleased yeah. some gods <laughs> and the ancient I think it's the other way around. Or pissed off somebody, yeah, exactly, clearly. Someone was like, please have her. We can't <laughs> deal with her. <laughs> no. She's pretty awesome, I must admit. Oh. Oh, yes. I love her. As much as we, I'll uh, pay you later. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. in seeds in from seeds the, from yeah. the swear jar. Yeah. Um, guys, any last words of wisdom to anyone listening to this today? Um, get on the road, go for it, wing it, figure it out as you go. Um, just yeah, like Grace said, don't be an asshole. That's and don't be scared to fail. Yeah. Yes absolutely love it I there couldn't be a more truthful and beautiful sentiment to finish on um yet again it's been a privilege to sit here and speak with you guys and learn more about your amazing lives um and if and if anyone needs like styling service dm me email me call me good and also if you need me to chase payment for you i'll be quite happy to do so (laughs) Uh, I love it. I love it. You're a gun for hire. I might even be calling you myself. Uh, uh-huh. um, Jason, same thing. DM you um, if anyone's interested in reaching yeah, out for collaborations. Absolutely. Yes. Brilliant. All, all the usual spots. Yes. Fab. Okay. Well, until the next reunion, guys. Thank I you know. so much for Thank this you, uh, chat. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.